Hello, everybody. I think we'll just give people another minute to enter and join the webinar, and then we'll get started. All right, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everybody. Welcome to the next Global Boyhood Initiative webinar series, Breaking Free from Stereotypes, Representations of Boyhood and Masculinity in the Media and Online Gaming. We're so excited to welcome all of our panelists today and everyone who's joining us from around the world today. Um, we have some great news. We have a simultaneous Spanish interpretation for this webinar today. If you look at the toolbar in the bottom of the Zoom function, you'll see a globe where you can click on that and uh, choose um, interpretation in Spanish if you're interested today. And um, thanks to our interpreter who's on online with us as well. Uh, I'd like to turn it over to Jose Campi Portalubi, who is our uh, Director of Communications at Ecomundo, who will kick us off today. And thank you again for joining. Thank you, Caroline, for that. And welcome everyone to this space and to the to, to this edition of the GBI webinar series. As Caroline mentioned, break, called Breaking Free from Stereotypes, Representations of Boyhood and Masculinity in the Media and Online Gaming. Bienvenidos y bienvenidas a todos y todas quienes nos acompañan hoy día. We're really excited about this edition of the webinar because this is the first time that we are having simultaneous interpretation in Spanish and in an effort from GBI to try and break language barriers. This is also the first day where we're launching the French edition of our report, which means that the Global Boyhood Initiative is becoming multilingual in French, in Spanish, and in English as we move to working in Latin America, in the case of Mexico and Bolivia, with the support of our partner Hendes there. We, I, I'd like to apologize if I've made any mistakes. English is not necessarily my first language, but I'm really happy to be able to accompany this space and help with the moderation of this conversation. Today, we are joined by three friends of the Global Boyhood Initiative. We're joined by Soraya Jacardi, senior researcher at the Norman Lear Center, USC Annenberg. We're joined by Abby Burroughs, researcher at the Center for Scholars and Storytellers from UCLA. And we're joined as well by Fernando de Souch, who is the managing director for New Macho, which and also the creative force responsible for the new branding that the Global Boyhood Initiative has now on our social media and throughout all of our different channels. My name, as Caroline said, is Jose Campi Portalupi. I'm director of communications at Equimundo. I've just recently joined the organization and I'm delighted to be here. I'm a PhD candidate for the University of Vigo in equity and innovation. And I come from a background of research in the representation specifically of LGBTQI populations in the media. So I was, I was saying before to the people who were here at the beginning that it's incredibly interesting and special for me to be able to geek out with people that share the same passion for representation studies, that understand that representation matters, that it has an impact, whether positive or negative, that is to be discussed. 
on uh, like on the stuff that we see and the stuff that we consume helps shape us what is visible but it also what is what remains invisible can affect us directly in who we are and how we interact with each other as Caroline said, there's the interpretation button at the toolbar. I'm just going to explain that in Spanish shortly for the people that are joining us from, from Spanish-speaking countries. Para todas las personas que están acá, que nos siguen desde América Latina o que nos siguen desde España, este webinar tiene la posibilidad de interpretación simultánea en la barra que van a ver al inferior del Zoom. Tienen la posibilidad de seleccionar en el globo terráqueo que está ahí la opción del idioma en el que quieren seguir esta charla y les agradecemos enormemente por acompañarnos acá a todas las personas que hablan en español. Uh, how is this going to work? We have our panelists with us. We're going to, we, we have ready a couple of questions that we would like to ask them and they're going to have from five to seven minutes to share with us their answers we can start collecting all of your questions from everyone who joins us today through the Q&A function and we'll try to answer all of them at the end. If we do not manage to get to all of them, what we'll do is we'll answer them later and then upload a blog entry to our GBI site or to our equipment site and share it with you so that you can see the answers to the questions if we didn't manage to solve them all. So to get it started again, welcome for everyone to be here. We know that it's a longer webinar, but it's just because we have really interesting and cool stuff to discuss with all of you. I'd love to start with Fernando. And question for us is why a focus on boyhood in the media and does focusing on boys take away from girls and other genders? And maybe also tell us a bit of what led you to work at New Macho and why do you think it is important? Sure. Thank you uh, for inviting me and thanks everybody for, for joining today. So um, let's separate the questions, otherwise it's going to be quite complex. But you asked me first why, why boyhood. Uh, we need to pay, pay attention in boyhood in the media. And the answer is because we, if we don't do it, they will, they will do it anyway. So boys are uh, forming the their identity and forming who they are, how they have to behave. So maybe when they are five, six, seven, eight, they are going to look for that in their parents, in teachers, in, in peers. And then may, very early after that, they will start getting that from, from social media as well and, and media in general, entertainment and so on. So it's very important that we pay attention at the moment that they are building who they are, what is acceptable for a, a boy to behave, what is not, that uh, we pay attention to what they are getting from media. Um, I have a good example of that. That is when I, I work in, in the subject of masculinity. And last year when I heard from Andrew Tate for the first time, I went to my son that was 11 at the moment. I said, uh, have you heard about this guy, Andrew Tate? And he said to me, oh, yes, I know him. I said, what? You know him? And I work in this, I don't know him. I said, how do you know him? Oh, because it's all over the internet. So this is at the moment that it's not about, say, let's talk about Andrew Tate cancellation. No, no, let's talk about Andrew Tate. Sorry, let's talk about the internet. Let's talk about the media, your internet, my internet. So how that works. So I think it's important that we are more there in, in, in starting to judging the stuff they have, how they come to them. And this is why important, it's very important that we show and discuss with them what is media and how they interpret that. The second question I think was about um, if this goes uh, against or, or, or ahead for gender equality. And, and for sure, it's, uh, it's brilliant for, for gender equality because uh, as I said, guys, six, seven, eight, eight year olds are hearing for the first time that a boy should behave differently. So, so far they don't have that in their minds. They, they, are, they don't have the separation of behaviors of the masculine or the feminine. And they start listening to that, maybe from the parents, from the, from the first expressions of media and entertainment. And they starting to behave that way, uh, doing so called masculine thing, things more often because they want to like to their parents, their peers, their, their coaches. And, and sadly start rep repressing others that the, the society consider feminine. And this is done in the beginning in a 
conscious way, they decide what to do, but with time that becomes unconscious, which is very risky because you get that disconnected man. A boy that is disconnected from the feminine, well, it will go against of, 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 of gender equality because it's more difficult for, for them to put themselves in other shoes, develop compassion, caring, and other characteristics because emotional expressions, because those are uh, considering as, as feminine and early uh, get out from the um, book of what is, is to be a boy and later a man. And what new macho, this is, uh, I don't have, uh, I will try to do this in, in the two minutes I have, but new macho is, works exactly for that. So what we want to do is a, is a strategic unit for an agency called BBD Perfect Storm. And what we do there is how we can work in the two biggest conditioning that we are seeing that are affecting men in the way that brand communication can help to pave the way toward a sustainable gender equality. And the two biggest conditions that we have is the one that we just discussed. So what is this to be a man from early boys and all of this uh, book, the man book and man books that, that we can talk later. But there's a second condition in that very strong is when we are uh, teenagers, young adults, and we are already emotionally disconnected because we are a man, um, is how we define the successful man, the aspirational man that is still in our society and through the media is um, quite narrow and materialistic with when men are more value for what they have or how they look more than who they are and, and the changes they can bring to the world. And we have done recently a report that we are launching on Monday that reinforces that point, showing that even men are starting to change in the perception of what makes them successful and happy, but still media uh, and advertising is, is rooted in the past. So we really need to continue that. So to, to close for new match, we're doing these two things. So how we can work with brands to open new ways of aspiration for men, that is not just materialistic, but others. And we are also working with brands and, and, and from the, with the industry in how we can help uh, boys to develop uh, in a more equitable way. And this is exactly what we are doing with the Global Boyhood Initiative, that you are doing a fantastic job from the, they are going to schools and start opening and relaxing the pressures of what it means to be a, mona, a boy and a future man in kids. So it's fantastic. Thank you, Fernando, for sharing some of the interesting work that you're doing to try to reshape the world of advertising. Uh, we really appreciate that. Uh, Soraya, I, I, I would love to, like I, I'm seeing the Norman Lear Center in your background, and I, I, I would love to, and, and you also worked and collaborated with us with the Gina Davis Institute and the Equimundo Report called If He Can See It, Will He Be It? Can you tell us or share some about that report and what the big headlines there were? Great. Um, thank you so much. So as you mentioned, um, I'm a senior researcher at the Norman Lear Center, and we are a nonpartisan research and public policy center that seeks to study and understand the social and cultural impact of entertainment on audiences. And before being at the Norman Lear Center, I was at the Gina Davis Institute, which is how my collaboration with Equimundo came to be. And we worked on a number of reports. We worked on um, one report called, If He Can See It, Will He Be It? Where we looked at um, television content that was popular among young boys aged seven to 13. And we were looking um, to identify messages about masculinity that were present in the content. And what we found was that, you know, male characters were less likely than female characters to show emotions, including things like empathy and happiness. And this emotional restrictiveness was actually more prominent among male characters of color um, compared to white male characters, which is also of concern. Um, so, um, you know, we also saw that male characters were shown in general, just displaying a, a greater number of traditional gender values. So for example, male characters were less likely to be shown in um, hands-on parenting duties. They were also less likely to be shown as competent parents. Um, they were, however, more likely than female characters to be shown engaging in risky behaviors. And overall, um, looking at, you know, there's this popular content among young boys, overall, the most prominent um, stereotype about masculinity that we saw depicted in children's television is that of men and boys 
um, uh, as aggressors. So male characters committed, you know, 63% of violent acts against another person. They were also more likely to be shown as victims of violence themselves. And they were far more likely than female characters to use violence as a tool of retaliation or as a tool for personal gain. Um, and in a separate study, which was also a study between um, the Gina Davis Institute and Equimundo, we also looked at messages around masculinity in online gaming um, by examining the you know, messages about masculinity among the top Twitch streamers. And similar to our television content analysis, we found um, a huge prevalence of messages around aggression and violence. Um, so male characters were far more likely to be carrying a gun, to engage in violence, um, to kill other characters. And interestingly enough, one of the main motivations for engaging in violence within that video game um, study was personal gain. Right, um, which is which is interesting there. Uh, not you know the good of society or saving people or rescuing, but personal gain or retaliation. Um, so what we see across various types of media is a reinforcement of of many different um, you know traditional gender norms and traditional gendered values, particularly when it comes to notions of aggression and violence. So, oh, sir. Really interesting and worrying findings, Soraya. Thank you for sharing that with us. Abby, could you tell us about UCLA's CSS work on men and boys? I'm especially interested because of my background on that current superheroes project that you're working on. Yeah, of course. Uh, so, hi, my name is Abby Burris. I work at the Center for Scholars and Storytellers, which is also based in California. We're over here at UCLA. Uh, I'll start off by telling a little bit about CSS for those unfamiliar. Awesome. Um, Center for Scholars and Storytellers collaborates with the creative community uh, to unlock the power of storytelling and help the next generation thrive and grow. So we have a very specific folk focus on adolescence, uh, which is defined by the National Academy of Sciences as the extended period from time ages to 10 and 25. Uh, where a whole bunch of really important social, cognitive, and biological changes are happening. Uh, and this means that people in this age range are incredibly influenced by various types of media, as uh, my fellow panelists here have discussed. So CSS really focuses on also bridging this gap between scientific research and media creation uh, in order to better reflect the lived experiences of adolescents for storytellers. So we support those content creators who are working towards challenging these entrenched cultural narratives. Uh, we focus on a really wide variety uh, based on the adolescence. So we challenge key issues uh, around diversity, equity, inclusion, uh, mental health, and inequality. Uh, yeah, and CSS has been doing work related to gender and specifically masculinity since uh, they were founded by Dr. Yalda T. Wools in 2019. Uh, we created a, the boys tip sheet, uh, which I believe is going to be dropped in chat for us, uh, which is a collaboration with child development experts and entertainment industry professionals uh, to flip the script on male representation and media. Uh, and it includes a lot of actionable items for creators and checklists in shaping these on-screen characters. Because as has been said, this time to be a boy is really difficult for a lot of reasons, but it's really important to see these positive representations of masculinity uh, and to really make sure there are different types of men and different types of masculinity being expressed in a positive way. So this tip sheet was really positively received um, because it does take things that we know are uh, helpful, psychologically speaking, for adolescents and it makes them into actionable items. So hopefully we can see more of that better change. Uh, specifically, when I was joining as an intern last year, uh, over a year ago now, which is crazy, uh, the one project I was most excited about that I was uh, immediately on board with is the Superheroes Project, which has been funded by FAST, Funders for Adolescent Science Translation. Uh, and this was a very extensive project looking at masculinity and superheroes and how uh, adolescent understanding and representation of superheroes has changed in recent years. Uh, superheroes as
it's going to save the girl. Uh, but that has been changing a lot. So the specific project was talking to teenagers and doing a general media sweep and seeing differences in the culture. Uh, so we started off by uh, doing really, really big literature review. That was the first project I worked on. So the first part of the project that I worked on. So we looked at uh, the wide stretch of research already available, looking at the combination of superheroes and masculinity um, and seeing how these different interpretations and how these different representations uh, are interpreted by adolescents, by youth. Uh, we did a whole bunch of different revisions of questions to ask and uh, a really large media sweep looking at different types of superheroes in current media. Uh, yeah, so again, we had those big budget live action shows and then also other media. Uh, we looked at some comics, we looked at TV shows, we looked at animated stuff because a lot of representation in superheroes, while verily, uh, is various a lot of different ways across media. The types of representation we see is not the same uh, in like cartoons that it is in these big films. That was really interesting to talk to the kids about. Uh, so yeah, then after this, we held a wide focus group with a whole bunch of high school students at LA Unified School District. Um, and we really were finding out their opinions of masculinity because, uh, they are being brought up by media more than previous generations ever have. I, I'm as well. Uh, I'm a 20 year old, so I really felt related to a lot of this research. Um, yeah, and we found a lot of interesting stuff. There's certainly not the best representation, especially the big budget ones. We're moving towards, I want to say a better direction, but definitely not fast enough. Um, kids, had a lot of aspirational views of this stoic masculinity uh, and it was very cool to learn so much about the research project going through this research research process um, and yeah I was, I'm excited about it. Uh, it. It is really great to hear about that Abby. I'm, I'm, I'm really passionate about the subject. I'm a kid that was raised with comic books and I've read a lot of research that child led that positive in comic books and in, in those type of contents because they traditionally have been a space for resistance. There's been less policing by society of what happens there. So there's been an opportunity to have less rigid representations of masculinity or, or of gender diversity. Comic books were one of the first medium that covered, for example, the HIV pandemic under the storyline of the legacy virus with the com with the X-Men comic books. And it has usually been a space for kids that identify as gender diverse specifically to be able to find themselves in throughout those pages. I do think that the big comic book blockbuster, the blockbusters and the superhero blockbusters that we have nowadays maybe challenge that because there's a bigger lens put on top of them. But but thank you. It, it's really interesting. And Soraya, going back to you, I, I know that through your research, you focus on measuring the impact of entertainment stories on real world attitudes, beliefs, intentions, behaviors, and cultural change. Could you share with us what are the most effective narrative shift strategies that you identify in the entertainment industry when it comes to representations of boyhood? Yeah, so I am so glad you asked this question um, because it's something that we've been talking a lot about recently in the last few weeks at the Lear Center. Um, so the Norman Lear Center has been examining the impact of entertainment for over 20 years. And we study the impact of entertainment across a wide variety of topics and social issues. Um, so, you know, just to give you some examples, in the last year alone, we've looked at, you know, the impact of media on audiences' beliefs about gun safety, on their attitudes about climate change, on attitudes towards charitable giving, et cetera. So um, over, you know, within the last week, the Lear Center actually published a report. It's titled Lights, Camera, Impact. Um, and the purpose of that report was to synthesize, you know, 20 years of research and, and to identify the best practices that we have seen over and over and over, regardless of what particular topic um, or social issue we're, we're talking about. Um, and some of the things that we have found um, across this research is, you know, one, it's so important for storylines um, to come off as, to come across as authentic and not as preachy. So when a storyline comes across as preachy, it can lead to psychological resistance. 
um, psychological reactants, sorry. And reactance is a sense of anger that you get when you feel like a storyline is too overtly trying to convince you of something. And it can reduce or completely eliminate the intended impact of a storyline. Um, so it, it's always important, right, that when we, you know, the entertainment value of content is always very important. You don't want to sacrifice that entertainment value by coming across as too preachy, um, you know, or, or making it feel like too much of a lesson. Another thing that we have found um, across our research is that identification or seeing yourself in the character is a really important mechanism. So what we need to see is uh, we need to make sure that the media um, is reflecting the diversity of boyhood and manhood on screen. So tying this back to, you know, the if he can see it, will he be it report? We in that report, we saw a severe underrepresentation of indigenous or Middle Eastern characters. We saw a near invisibility of queer characters. And that's despite the fact that 20% of Gen Z identifies as being part of the LGBTQ community. Um, and we saw very few male characters, less than you know 1.5% with disabilities. But, um, you know, boys and men of, of color exist, right? Queer boys and men exist. Um, men and boys with disabilities exist in the real world. They're just not seeing themselves reflected in entertainment media. Um, so we, we need to make sure that we are ref reflecting a broader sense of what it means to look like or be a, a boy or a man. Um, another thing that we, we kind of find consistently across our studies is it's always best when we can focus on systemic versus individualistic problems and solutions. And this one can be a little bit challenging um, because so much of our storytelling focuses on telling these really compelling personal narratives, but it's always ideal when we can tie that back to systemic issues. And I'll give you an example of what I mean by that. This is not a masculinity example. This is actually an example from a, a different topic, but it can give you a sense of what I mean by systemic versus individualistic. Um, there's a program um, on television. It's a medical drama. Right. Um, and like many medical dramas, you've got the hero doctors that save the patients. There's an episode where um, we see one patient that keeps returning to the hospital over and over and over. And what the doctors realize is this is a systemic issue. Right. We can treat this patient as many times as we as we can. But the problem is this patient is homeless. Right. And the problem is going to continue over and over and over until we can fix the systemic issues. So you see for a moment that that focus on systemic, but then the story reverts back to this hero doctor finds the patient a place to live and a job, which is lovely and beautiful. And I wish all doctors were out there doing that, but it's probably too high of a burden to place on individual people. And we need to be thinking more about systemic solutions. Um, and then again, you know, one last thing that's really important is cumulative exposure within and across stories. So if our media is saturated with narratives about traditional or restrictive forms of masculinity, then we're going to need a lot more than one or two storylines that are challenging those narratives. Um, so so those are some of the, the many different factors that we have found across our research on a variety of different topics in terms of things that can make the impact stronger. Thank you for that. I think it's Stuart Hall that says that one of the definitions for re represent means to represent, so to reintroduce meaning or to resignify a reality. And coming from a guy that grew up as a racialized Latino gay kid in Latin America, not feeling seen and not being able to see yourself or identify yourself within the media that you're consuming, has it and represents its challenges while you're growing up. So I, I really thank you for your work <laughs> and the good work at the Normal Lear Center and that you're doing. Yes. And just to jump back in on, on something that you said, uh, you know, we are facing some interesting times in, in the country right now in terms of legislation being advanced in various states. That is trying to restrict what we can talk about with children in terms of gender identity, sexual identity. Um, but not talking about those things doesn't make those issues disappear. Queer boys, queer children will still exist. And so in, in situations in which 
um, you know, we're seeing this legislative push to, to restrict conversations, it's even more important that some of these um, marginalized communities that don't see themselves represented, it's even more important um, to have representation for them um, during the, these times. Completely agree. Not talking about diversity doesn't make it disappear. It just means that it's less represented or underrepresented. But thank you for that, Soraya. Fernando, you were talking about the power of advertising and the work that you're doing with New Macho. From the work that you're conducting in there, what are some of the ways that you've seen your work have a positive impact for brands themselves and the voice within their audiences? Yeah, so we work uh, twofold. So we work by trying to lead the industry agenda in this subject. So how we can uh, talk to a more positive masculinity or masculinities. And we do that in many forums in UN, can uh, universities and so on. Uh, and this is just to bring more people with us. So when they work with their brands and the, 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 marketing, the marketing campaigns, um, they consider this subject within the way the act and for sure representation, as Soraya said, was is there always. But there is something more where we work with brands. Of course, of course, we need to represent the world as, as it is, and this is part of the things we do. But in general, the way we work is, it's not that we said we do a statement about this is a man, this is not a man, or this is behaving masculine, masculine way or not. So each brand have an emotional space that use uh, to connect with our target. No? So examples I can bring is Axe or Links here and, and Ruffles in, in Latin America in, uh, that have more uh, use, have been using attraction as a space for showing the resistibility of the product, of, this, of the promise of the product. So, but it, it, it became a problem for that because they, they have a very linear um, relationship or definition of attraction. So it was always... Um, a guy and a girl, and if possible, one guy, one hot girl, and many hot girls as possible better. So it was really not bringing up where society were going. So we needed to understand what were the stereotypes that were underpinning that, that behavior for the brand. And this is an example of, of, of how we work. So for example, for, for those cases, we needed to understand a little bit Okay, what, what guys think that they makes them attractive? And when we talk to them, they told us, well, I am more attractive if I am buff, if I have muscles, I show off money and I become manly. This is why how I become more attractive. So we went to girls and uh, that they were their type, target and said, okay, what do you look at in a man? And they told us, well, we like men that make us laugh and it's comfortable being who they are. So we went back to guys. Are you comfortable with me who you are? And in general, no, they are not because they, 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 they need a little bit of validation for that. And this is how we said, okay, we need to change brands and we need to, to open this idea of attraction, not just in genders, diversity of race, or what, but also in these values, showing that when guys are who they, they are, they have more chances to really end up with the goal they are looking for. And this is the way we're redefining attraction from a, a game of conquering to a game of connections. So when guys were connecting with the, their target, being women, other guys, that was the way that they will be more authentic and they will have more chances of engaging in, in, the, in the attraction. So this is, there were two big successful campaigns and this is the way we can liberate teenagers of the pressure of performing and start validating that it's more effective to be who you are. Uh, we can work directly with, with teenagers or boys with the campaigns, but also we can work with parents, uh, how we can help to make more healthy uh, relationship with, mainly between fathers and, and sons, um, a more present parenting. Uh, one example was working for the Darmen Plus Care brand. When they came to us saying, look, we have a problem, Made men don't care for themselves, they think it's feminine or, or it's a um, self-indulgent trait. So how we can make them to, to care? Because we sell products that talk about self-care and personal care. So we go again to talk to people, say, why don't you care about yourself? 
And they told us the same. So it's feminine, I don't have time for that. They don't tell it in that way, but it's very clear. So we said, okay, what, what do you care about? Uh, well, I care about my family. I care, I care about my loved ones. So this is when we, we, we engage with, with you and team at Equimundo. I said, look, we have this problem. So men that don't care for themselves, but they care for the families. Is there any way we can prove that by caring for themselves, care more for the families? And not is that we were uh, just doing a rule of thumb. We see it all the time. Uh, and the, the, the output for that research was amazing because that shows that it's not that when men care physically, they care about themselves, they care more for others, which in general, physical, some men, they do. But they, if they care uh, about themselves um, emotionally and socially, they even care more and more time and more people. So we did a campaign for, for the launch of, for, for Father's Day in the US a couple of years ago that is called Carely to Care. And, and we our tagline was uh, caring for others start by caring for you. And by giving the permission to to fathers to take time to care and unwind is how they can be more present parents. So these are examples of how we can subvert and, and ditch stereotypes that are not serving the narrative of masculinity anymore, changing for others that serve, but not just men, but the community around. The way they connect in relationships, the way they connect as parents and uh, daughters as well. Thank you for that, Fernando. I think that phrase of liberating teenagers from the pressures of performing is quite powerful <laughs> and it's quite honestly is something that we all feel at some at some point that there is a pressure on us behaving in a specific way. And it is really interesting to see and refreshing to see someone working not just from the academic side or, or from the research side, but working within the industry to change that and to challenge that, specifically in a world where advertising is no longer limited to billboards or the, to the TV in the living room, but where it's like as permanent and as om omnipresent as all of the other medium are. If, if we have it in our pockets, if, we if, if it's the first thing that we watch when we wake up and the last thing we watch when we go to bed, it has become more powerful and therefore it, it can be a better ally for change or a more pernicious agent as well. But, but thank you for sharing it. Abby, uh, you were commenting before that you're 20 years old, you're maybe from a younger generation than some of us, even though we want to feel very, very young still. <laughs> but coming from your perspective and from, and, from, and from your professional experience, like how is the media landscape evolving for the next generation and helping change conceptions of gender? What do you think, for example, that people in leadership positions don't understand about the media and the impact that it's having in, in younger generations or in your generation? Of course, that sounds great. Uh, so yeah, a little bit more personal context. Again, I am 20 years old. Uh, I'm graduating from UCLA uh, next week. Uh, so a lot of my work and opinions are grounded in the fact that I am this younger generation. I am the upcoming generation. Uh, I've also been a fan of superheroes my entire life. I've been reading comics, uh, watching old like Super Friends and Batman the Animated Series uh, with my older brother my entire life. Um, and a lot of these stories have influenced what I'm interested in, the, the types of emotionality that's seen in a lot of cartoons and a lot of comics. I wasn't able to access in a lot of other media. Uh, as, as you were saying before as well, uh, comics started off as very much a fringe of society thing. And because of this, because they were made for these nerds, they weren't made for the cool people, they were able to stretch these expectations of what was expected of their protagonist. Their protagonists didn't all have to be uh, white, cis, straight men. They could be more nuanced. They could come from different backgrounds. And of course, it wasn't perfect at the time, um, but we were able to tell different stories. Uh, and now a lot of people don't have that conception of superheroes anymore because in recent years it has totally become mainstream, which is not a bad thing. I'm happy to share the joy of superheroes with as many people as I can. Uh, but as you see the shift of like the era where superheroes became more mainstream instead of less mainstream. Uh, all of the stories, all of the movies that came out, all the big budget ones people were talking about, Spider-Man, Batman, Iron Man, they're all stories about these straight cis men saving, straight white cis men saving the day from this big one evil man who can just be super evil. And the only emotion they have is maybe they love 
their girl and that's all we really get there's not a lot of emotional complexity there's no like best friends there's no them going through internal struggles in these earlier movies um and luckily we've been able to see a really big change to that in recent years uh stories aren't necessarily all only about that still a huge problem of course but like the latest Black Panther movie, uh, totally an emotional story, talking about grief, talking about death. And it's still through this lens of uh, from looking at through masculinity still uh, in a way. And same with the original one, it's going away from the single point of what it means to be masculine. Um, yeah, and I think it's also important to talk about the movies aren't the only form of superheroes that we get to enjoy. Uh, I grew up on, again, the animated series, where some of like my first memories of like whoa that's a lot of emotion are like talking about uh friendship with superheroes which uh, batman the animated series they have a whole bunch of really complex storylines about just different ways that to exist and it's not just the male superheroes they have they're just on par with everyone else and they all come from different backgrounds they all have different goals and it allows for these beautifully diverse types of stories. And I feel like with the new Spider-Man movie that came out recently, you get to see all of these wonderful different backgrounds, all these different subcultures and how these are brought forward to tell more stories. So I think what's really, I want people to know is this, it's beautiful to learn from others. And the fact that um, media, a lot of the times like, oh, we gotta go with the safe option, you know? Everyone can relate to this one, this guy, everyone can relate to this classically masculine dude. Uh, not, no, <laughs> first of all, no. And also, if you have a problem with learning from other stories, if you can't find the beauty in different types of backgrounds, different types of masculinity, shouldn't you be challenging that? Shouldn't you be moving this storyline this goalpost forward so we get to have these more beautiful stories uh and yeah i think my generation is really excited to see all of these changes happening and be pushing them forward uh there's as uh was said earlier i believe uh, this generation is queer than ever before because we're in a time where we can talk about it more than ever before uh i didn't grow up without the internet uh, most of my friends, and I found this out recently because I didn't get a phone until high school, most of my friends had iPhones in elementary school, which is wild for me to think about. But when you're thinking about how much media is being consumed and how much of an impact it has, it's so much. And uh, Gen Alpha was born after the invention of the iPhone. Every single one of them has not been alive without an iPhone. Uh, I was doing some interviews for a class last quarter and uh, this girl, her earliest memories were watching Peppa Pig on her mom's phone. That was her earliest memories of anything she had was on the phone. And that's why it's so important for these types of representation, for these diverse perspectives uh, in masculinity and in a broader sense. Uh, so yeah. <laughs> I, I, I really agree. Uh, it's, it's, I, I think I could talk to another comic book fan for hours. I, I do think that there's also a great power in how we're consuming media right now and, and that we have maybe abandoned that traditional model of self-contained stories. The idea of the sequel has allowed for bigger character arcs and for growth and development. You went from having an Iron Man that solved everything through arrogance, money and violence to an Iron Man that is allowed to show care, to become a dad, to be loved, to show love. And I think that there's, there's a great power in that because it shows us that even cis hetero men within that become like sort of the superhero archetypes can be flawed and can be vulnerable. But and, and I think that I'm just hoping that that permeates to other medium as as well. Fernando, I, I, I wanted to go back to you as in Equimundo, we just published last week a piece of research called State of American Men that focused like that focuses or that, or, or that tries to address the crisis of masculinity that we acknowledge and that we recognize that is happening in the States, but that is happening everywhere else. One of the things that comes out of that study is the amount of people that trust problematic or that trust some online influencers and figures like Andrew Tate, Jordan Peterson, and, and others. And it shows that more and more people are depositing their trust in them. And it is not just white young men, it is men from different ethnicities and from different ages. 
I wanted to know and talk to you about the because of the rise of these radical influencers and the increase in misogyny that some of us feel and, and identify online, what are some of the ways that from new matter you think we can help change the narratives of healthy boyhood in our digital world? Yeah, of course, this is a, a complex one. No, it's something that is emerging and we are seeing a regression. So we are seeing that after not validating certain changes that men were having in terms of adopting uh, other values uh, through society, some of them are regressing. And there is, a, after the stress of not understanding who they are anymore, those simple mantras of this is the way to be a man, this is the way to be successful, this is the way to get the money, the girls, is could be attractive in the moment of of desperation but but there are many things that 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 can be done um also there are great as, as the, the 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 people were saying uh, the co-panelists were saying a lot of role models that, that we can that we can use so there are many things we can do one i think is uh, going back again to global boyhood is helping parents and and teachers to deal with this to educate Voice on how internet works, how to talk to them, how to listen to them. And we recently have done together these uh, tips for, for parents on how they can engage in the discussion because the world, so the things are happening and they need to know that and they need to know how to engage for that because as, as we were saying, so you, you said that you know, media changed a lot before we can manage what our kids see. Don't go to bed, you don't see the, the TV, you don't see that show. Now we don't know the show they are doing, so what, what they're watching, and, and also what is coming after what they're watching. So it's, it's very difficult. So we need to be equipped on, on how to, to drive the conversations and how to talk to them for equip them. So one is that it's, it's education for, our, for, for ourselves, of, of, of uh, parents, teachers, and other roles we can have, coaches, uh, so we can help them to navigate that complexity and try to separate from what they listen as an influencer what they think is right and what is not. They can have a view on that. Other way, of course, they are very good influencers. So as we have the, uh, and today's we have Marcus Rashford and we have uh, brands that can really make those messages bigger. And, and the, some brands are doing it and we can continue using brands to be a sponsor or have as a spokesperson, someone that brings a uh, positive and a different male message that validates these new values that, that the men are boys uh, and teenagers are having. So there is something there. But there's one that is a little bit less intuitive, but it's obvious <laughs> at the same time, which is a contradiction, but is that most of the influencer for men are men. And are men in the same conditioning or raises men with the same conditioning that we all have. So there's a lot of like, um, so how teaching or discussing with the influencers to make them think. Because you have people that write drugs a lot of attention, KSI here in the UK, Logan Paul in the US. So they drag and they want to be good. And sometimes they get to dark spaces, but because they don't know, they, they, they like call out, call out and they say, I was wrong. But maybe you can work. And there's an example from Movember. Movember has been working with influencers last year or the year before bringing messages to positive messages to the audiences. The first thing that the influencers said, all of them was, that was great for me. And then when they did it and land the messages in their own channels, the success was huge. They had, they had a huge success. So this is, I think there's a lot of awareness. So it's just starting the discussion. They most of or many of the influencers. I, I, I think we are for the way the algorithm works, the internet works to, to show off more what is um, more traumatic, violent, more, more uh, exaggerated. Maybe we see more of the stuff or with more space to the stuff that is we consider mostly bad. There's a lot of good stuff. Uh, and we can see that very clear in entertainment. So um, they are positive role models. So one of the shows more awarded and uh, 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 most seen last year and this year is Ted Lasso. The values of Ted Lasso are amazing. Are just playing against 
what is a show of footballer, what is a careful footballer, what how you can demonstrate your emotions in a row when even if you are a very traditional man, and how you can be a successful coach even if you are a soft man. And, and with that, we have many. So one, I think, uh, um, Wakanda Forever uh, from, from Black Panther and Black Panther, all of these are, are there. And it's, it's not about censoring ones and raising others. It's just open the discussions and equip people, including, of course, boys and, uh, and young boys and teenagers on how to judge that. They are more clever than, 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 than we think. So when I was, and I'm going to finish with this, uh, I had the chance to go to one of the, um, the classes for global boyhood and see boys 6 to, to 12 or to 11 years interacting. They are very savvy. They are totally understanding genders. They are totally understanding environment. So of course, they have less knowledge on the, on the details. But they get the, the concept and, and what is the, uh, a little bit of, of the, um, the role to care that. So we need to just keep that, not trim them from that, and equip them with more uh, wisdom and, and, and knowledge so they can do more with, with, with those feelings they have. So I think the situation is, is bad, and but could go either way. We, we discussed in, in our recent research that men are in the tipping at the tipping point. Sorry, men are at the tipping point. Either we go and um, progress because we are already moving on, or we can be dragged down to the past because there are no cultural and social validation of these new beliefs that we are having. And this is not about progressive or traditional. It's about both. We are all sometimes progressive, sometimes traditional in our own way for the specific things. So this is, I think, what we need to, to consider and try to grow a, a holistic new narrative from there, which is, I think, a little bit what Abhi just said, start opening, and sorry as well, start opening the, the spaces, not just by race, not just by gender uh, identities or expression, not just by, by abilities, but also about values. Thank you, Fernando, for that. I, I really appreciate you bringing a more positive note and, and making us see the brighter side. Sometimes when we talk about this, it can turn bleak very quick, but it's really good to, to, be re, to, to be reminded that there's positive experiences everywhere, that kids have a great capacity for change and that are maybe more open than some of us adults are to diversity, to change and to continue learning. Thanks. Soraya, I, I would like to go back to you. We're, we're about to close and go back, go to the Q&A portion of it. But I just wanted to go back. You were mentioning that you first approached or you first met Equimundo in the context of that Gina Davis Institute in research study. And it, I remember it having a number of recommendations in the conclusion. What are some of the key ones and how else should we be thinking about raising boys in, in, in an increasingly digitized world? Um, yes, thank you. So actually a lot of the recommendations that we raised and that we outline in that report parallel a lot with some of the things that Fernando was just um, talking about with us. So, you know, in terms of, you know, things that parents or those who are working with boys can do, um, you know, one important thing is to identify healthy or positive role models, both in media, but also in real life. So if you see a good example, call it out, you know, say it out loud. Oh, I really like X, Y, or Z about this character. Same thing when you see stereotypical depictions of manhood, right? You might see it and you might register in your head as like, you know, I didn't love that or that felt very restrictive or that felt unhealthy, um, but say it out loud, right? Start that conversation with your children um, and maintain an open dialogue. I always like to say communication over restriction. The older children get and the more our media landscape changes, the harder it can be to restrict the types of content that children are exposed to, which is not to say that you should not have any rules or, you know, every household needs to kind of decide what's best for their family. But um, communication over restriction, we need to prepare boys and help them navigate the media landscape that they're going to encounter in the world. And I always like to, to suggest starting dialogue or conversations with what do you think about rather than making declarative statements like 
this show or this character or this content is bad or problematic or this or that, start by just saying, what do you think about X, Y, or Z? Um, and, and let the, you know, let um, the boys and adolescents in your life, let them lead the conversations um, and, and maintain that dialogue, maintain that relationship as much as possible. Yeah, I, I think from, G, from the GBI point of view, we completely agree with that. If anyone that is here is interested in sparking those conversations with kids, there's a bunch of conversation starter texts that we have on our site. We're in the process of translating them also to Spanish. We already have them in the Portuguese version and we're looking forward to doing them in French. But we do think that, yeah, just listening to kids and, and that power of communication versus restriction can be, really help affect change and can help affect how parents engage with this. There's We were just in the UK and we saw talking to parents and educators that there's a real hunger for resources that can help either spark these conversations or that can help tackle how you approach kids. I, I, I had conversations with a lot of moms that were coming my way and saying, hey, I with a daughter, I know what to do. I know what to say to her. You can have the world. You can do everything. I'm here to support you. Sometimes with a boy that we want to be raised as a feminist boy, that we want to be raised with different values, it's harder to engage. So it's it's really interesting that in the case of the Global Boyhood Initiative, we have some resources that can help move us that way. And finally, with Abby, I'm. Uh, I, I've really enjoyed this conversation. I, I just wanted to to know from you. You you were mentioning that you you approached the place where you're currently working at as an intern. What is your or what has been your biggest takeaway from your work on men, boys, and masculinities at CSS? And what do you think is maybe a missing area of research to better understand these issues and create a whole of society narrative shift with your peers? Of course. And it's totally. Uh, I think that the biggest takeaway I've had from all of this, because it's it's been a lot, it's been a long time going, so I feel like I've really gotten a lot of different perspectives, which I really appreciate. I think the most important thing that I'm going to take is it's such a great disservice to our youth if we frame feminism and if we frame uh, representation as needing to knock men down instead of bring everyone else up. Like uh, Fernando was saying earlier, we need to open the field instead of having this singular thing. It's it's not about like, oh, well, that's that single way. That's a super bad way. It's not that at all. It's we just want more stories to be told because as this entire conversation, the patriarchy affects men too. These young boys are being robbed of how to express emotion. They're given strict what? roles that are incredibly harmful to them, despite, you know, being in a position of power. It's how people like, oh, you know, I, I know how to raise the girl. I don't know how to raise the boy because of all of this. Like, at the end of the day, it hurts everyone. And we're all just people. Uh, so I think that's definitely one of my biggest takeaways. On a personal note, research is super fun. <laughs> uh, I love being able to work with the high schoolers and hear all the awesome things they had to say and like nuance they already had to the conversation. Kids are smart. Kids are super smart. Love that. I feel like there's a whole bunch more that can be done. Um, there needs to be more research looking at positive effects of representation like all these wonderful people are doing. Um, yeah, gender confirming care is great for trans and non-binary kids, we need more of that. Uh, if things are more normalized, uh, if it's just another way to be people, I think that's really important. Um, and yeah, conceptual, conceptions of masculinity are changing and growing. Uh, as discussion between different types of people, especially like with the internet and globalization from my generation, I feel like we have so much more access to others just to learn and have these discussions. And I, I think that's wonderful and beautiful. And I'm excited to see how it gets even more so as we get to go forward. Uh, yeah, I, I really think the key to acceptance is conversations, things like this webinar, all these wonderful groups and people uh, are just such a positive step in making uh, different types of masculinity more normalized because there's no wrong way to be masculine just like there's no wrong way to be a person. And on that note, thank you to to you, Abby, to you, Soraya, and to you, Fernando, for your for for your participation. We're moving now to the Q and A portion of this panel. I don't know if Caroline, you want to help us guide us through that process. Thanks, Jose, and thanks everybody for your amazing questions in the chat. 
um, and keep them coming, please, as Jose mentioned at the beginning. We'll try and do um, a wrap up at the end and cover any questions that we weren't able to answer today in the webinar in a forthcoming blog, blog post. Um, and so just to pick up on a um, concept that I saw in the chat that I really liked around reframing the game of conquest to the game of connection and how in place of um, a lot of the harmful narratives we're seeing, we're seeing a, a replacement with um, positive narratives. So in terms of studying the shifts of boys and young men exposed to these messages, um, what, are, what are some of the shifts we're seeing in today's media around um, um, making more connections between boys? And I think there was a one comment brought up in, around Ted Lasso brought up in the chat. So um, if anyone, I know Fernando talked a little bit about Ted Lasso, but um, maybe in terms of um, reframing uh, in the online gaming space and in um, just general media space um, around sports specifically, there was a, a question in the chat around sports. Are you all seeing any any positive shifts in, in the sporting world around um, purely it being around um, just games of conquest to games of connection through sports? Um, and yeah, if anyone has any initial thoughts on that, that'd be great. So are you giving me the chance to talk about Argentina and the football team? Is that soccer? Okay. I think that is the, the answer. So uh, even though I take in the, the conversation where I want to, that is uh, winning the World Cup, um, for me, this is a huge learning there. So I still, I think that sports, it's a long way to to go. So very recently, we have people coming out uh, as gay in massive sports, where statistically it's impossible that we don't have more genders than the ones that are the same. So still a lot to do. But there is something in the values of the team that won the World Cup that it was super interesting for me. Well, because it was a team that puts um, the collective um, like objective above the individual one. And most of them honestly went that the Captain Messi won that World Cup. So they started playing for that. And the coach, but the coach move it to we need to do it for, for the country. And, and you had a team that was very much into collaboration and very much into connection. There was only one that at the at some point have a problem of connecting with the team and he was naturally separated to the, from the team. And that shows how a connected team and a team that puts something above that their own individual desires, even though all of them want to, to, to win the World Cup, but they, they work more for another person and for the team, get to uh, amazing results. So I think there is something there that I would like to dig on more because it's something to, to learn. In the terms of the gaming space, there are brands that are doing great jobs. DAF is one of that ones. DAF has been championing how we can show diversity of avatars because in the gaming community, most of the avatars were hypersexualized women or hypersexualized men, like tough and, and buff uh, characters or very sexy and sexualized characters. They are opening uh, that through, through media. So I think, um, to answer, um, there are a lot to do, but this is an amazing channel. The idea that the last work, I think, is because it was rooted in football and soccer. So it was a passion point that allows boys, kids, and adults to connect through that passion point, but use that space to debate other things and open other, other possibilities. I think that, that is, we can do that much more. Thanks, Fernando. That's great. Um, I also want to turn to the, another question I'm seeing in the chat, and we've actually gotten this question um, or a similar question in most of our GBI webinars so far, and that's around the gender backlash that we're seeing. Um, and I know we've talked a little bit about it already in this webinar today, but um, I think there's there's a question asking about um, you know we've done we've had a lot of success in terms of breaking down the vestiges of unhealthy masculinity 
um, in modern narrative shifts, but there it's sort of potentially created a vacuum for more harmful figures like Andrew Tate, et cetera, to um, kind of exploit the vulnerabilities that that men feel as a result of uh, patriarchal norms of, around masculinity. And I think um, some of our recent data from Equimundo, our State of American Men data, does validate this to some degree in the sense that um, over 40% of the men that we interviewed or that we surveyed said they trusted at least one of the harmful figures in the in the manosphere, so to speak. And um, we found that 53% of men agreed that in America today, men have it harder than women. So uh, the the recent data that that's coming out of Equimundo is uh, to some degree validating this gender backlash um, that we're seeing in in popular media. So there is a question asking about, um, you know, how how can we develop actual role models that that work to break down harmful masculinities, but still don't rely on patriarchal assumptions around manhood. Um, and the example given was how healthy masculinity might put pressure on boys to be protectors, um, which still kind of result re um, relates to patriarchal norms of masculinity. So um, love to turn it to Soraya since you do so much work around narrative shifts um, and just any reflections on the gender backlash and, and this question in particular? Yeah, I think that's a, a great question. And one of the things that I like to remind myself of whenever I'm, I'm witnessing some of this backlash is always progress is not linear, right? With progress always comes backlash. And a lot of that, a lot of times that backlash comes from this place of you know, uh, kind of like masculinity's last stand, the last battle to uphold masculinity. Um, and and I think that uh, it's really important, one, to not get discouraged, um, especially, I like to always say this a lot to, to younger folks who are interested in challenging gender norms, um, who haven't, you know, I think if you're, if you've, if you're older, you've witnessed a longer period of time where you've seen both progress and backlash and the back and forth. If you're younger, seeing that might feel really discouraging. And it's important to remember, again, progress is not linear. Um, you keep going one foot in front of the, in front of the other. Um, and I think it's also really important to remember that a lot of times the backlash is not necessarily representative. It's just particularly loud, right? Um, so, you know, it's important to 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 keep an eye on, you know, for example, um, generally, right, um, you know, the values of Americans aren't necessarily represented by this loud vocal minority. Um, so keeping that in mind, um, you know, and keeping that lens in mind um, and and keeping, you know, for example, uh, one of the things that we've seen in entertainment media with regards to backlash is several films with um, either leads of color or with female leads have received a lot of backlash in the form of negative ratings. Um, so websites like IMDb, Rotten Tomatoes, et cetera, where users can log on and give their rating of a particular film, they, those websites were being weaponized by people. I'll use um, Star Wars, Star Wars an as an example. Those websites were being weaponized by people who didn't agree. They were jumping on, leaving all of these negative reviews and skewing the data. Now, a lot of these websites are now trying to take steps to to mitigate that from happening again in the future. But, um, you know, for example, my son is one of those people who regularly looks at the ratings of something before deciding whether he wants to see something or not. Um, and so every time he's looking at that, I like to remind them, who are the people that leave ratings? How accurate are ratings? Can we trust them? What kind of lens are people, um, you know, bringing in into the ratings? Um, in other words, thinking about the ways in which bias can be baked into what we what we understand as normative and challenging that and reminding um, myself and others, right, that again, um, progress isn't linear and that sometimes the backlash is really um, just a lot louder than um, than it really it, it really is. Caroline, I, I just I, 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 I'd love to add to that. I, I think that progress, I, I completely agree that progress is in linear. And that that backlash is coming from louder voices, not necessarily from a large majority of the population. And also that backlash comes from a place of not really understanding and sometimes from a place of fear. But we, I, I do think that it, it opens up an opportunity for us, at least coming from the gender space, but also from the comms point of view, to try to think and reflect on how we have been framing the conversation at times. 
I'm in the process of mapping the different commentaries that people leave on some of the publications that talk about masculinity and more positive and healthier ideas of masculinity. And some of them are coming, for example, from younger men that are saying, hey, you call me privileged, but it, I do not see privilege in my life. I'm, I'm poor. I'm not going to be able to have a house to live up that idea of what the American dream used to be. And sometimes the conversation can be discounting people or, and, and, and I think it, it just shows that there's a bigger room for improvement on how we engage with others. What is the language that we use with others, not just to break the barrier on from speaking English to Spanish, but even within the, speak, the English speaking crowd, how do we, how, how, how do we do that, that Fernando was saying that maybe taking a cue from that, some, some from idea of conquering and winning the conversation or winning an argument to better connecting and better engaging with the other. And I think that that's something that we are trying to do through the Global Boyhood Initiative, through Equimundo. And I think that it's, it's, a, it's in the spirit that all of us who have been speaking here or participating as an, as an audience share. Great, thanks Jose. And if Abby or Fernando wanna come in on this conversation, feel free. Um, otherwise I can move to the next question. Great, Abby. Yeah, just a quick little. Uh, I feel like conversations around white privilege are very interesting, especially on the understanding of the language because uh, a lot of people don't take it. They take it as, oh, I have white privilege. Where's, where's the privilege? Why am I not doing so well? Instead of a lack of additional obstacles. And I feel like small differences in the language and small misunderstandings of that uh, are often uh, missed in nuance. So I think it's very interesting to see uh, just because people get really offended. They're like, I don't have any privilege. I'm, I'm starting at rock bottom. And it's like, yes, but you have the removal of these additional intersectionalities of discrimination of harm that are making these extra obstacles. And I don't think a lot of people, especially young people who are like, why don't I have all of this? People are out to get me specifically when that's really very much not the case. Great addition, thanks, Abby. Um, great, so the next question is kind of reframing um, the conversation we've had so far today and making the link between masculinities and the role of women and female characters in promoting positive masculinities and just expanding the idea of gender norms to um, you know, anyone. So uh, there's also a question I wanted to flag about the link between masculinities and presenting these campaigns to women and particularly sur survivors of abuse and violence against women and making sure that as we continue our work, um, they don't feel alienated as their access to support following abuse is so limited um, and wondering why this conversation and um, airspace is being given to men. So uh, yeah, if we could just talk a little bit about those couple of questions that are in the chat, um, that would be great. And yeah, I will kick it to Fernando first. Yeah, I think it's a great point. First, uh, when we talk about masculinity or masculinities, it's, it's not that it's an attribute that is male. <laughs> Uh, affects everybody and and it's very interesting what is happening or what has been happening in the land of communication and advertising with empowerment of women when you through the lenses of the power men of women can start adding side hyper masculine behaviors in women and start showcase that also the same with success comes to my mind uh, an example of um, an ad from Nike with uh, Serena Williams saying, okay, I, I was a mother and two months after that, I play in the Grand Slam. So that could be a very strong source of pressure coming from a masculine space to women is that we want to normalize that and you are not a woman enough if you are, are not strong enough to be doing your job in two months after being birth. So it's very interesting. Uh, and there are brands also that we see that are continuing this hyper, the, the, the hyper masculinity behavior or this narrow definition of success using women then as images. Just the same coding that they would use a male character with a female character, but is, is still perpetrating that the concept of a certain uh, unhealthy way of express your masculinity or live your masculinity or masculinities. So this is a, um, something I think we need to care about. The, the last point I'm gonna say on that is many times, I'm talking to boys again, it's not that the pressure to boys, 
to perform or to put their act together come from fathers to kids. It come from parents. It come also from mothers that they may be said, oh, I want my son to be strong. The world is a difficult place. And in pure love and protection and care for the kid, as they want him not to suffer, they could be damaging or trimming him uh, from uh, vulnerability and expressing their feelings because that that would make uh, him weak for the tough world he needs to live in. So it's important those things so that there is not man to man that this, the, the, the continuity and the cycle of the hypermasculine is continuing and it's not that it's only expressed through male. Thanks, Fernando. Uh, go ahead, Sarah. Hi, just adding to that, uh, you know, one of the things that I like to to talk about, uh, you know, when this comes up is, you know, I like to remind folks that so much of what's considered masculine is defined in relation to what we call feminine, right? Oftentimes we define masculinity as a rejection of things that we define as feminine. So it's impossible to talk about women's issues to talk about those things without taking that context of thinking about how we're defining femininity and how we're defining masculinity. It's two sides of the same coin. And another thing that I, I also like to think about um, as, as someone who, you know, I consider myself a, a, a someone who's uh, you know, really tuned into the feminist advocacy world um, and, and who had to do a lot of thinking about this when I started thinking about, you know, researching masculinity and focusing on, on boys and men um, specifically, um, I started thinking only talking to women and girls about these, these topics is placing the burden of the patriarchy on women entirely. Women should not have to carry the burden of solving the patriarchy on uh, entirely on their own. On their own, we need to welcome boys and men into that conversation. They're impacted by the patriarchy as well, and they can help us dismantle it as well. Great, thanks, Sarah. Yeah, really powerful and. Uh, I think I've always been um, drawn to feminism because it's like expanded my idea of what I can be as a woman. And I think talking about masculinities and talking about men and boys, when, we're, when it's necessary to talk about that because we can expand the idea of what it means to be just like a general human as well. So um, yeah, thanks for those reflections. Um, I just want to turn to maybe a little bit more of a, some of the action-oriented questions as far as what can we all do? What can we do in the audience here? We have a, a question asking what men can do in their early and mid twenties to improve representations of masculinity in communities and in the media. Um, there's a question around how can we send feedback to movie producers, directors, and game creators? How do we contact them to request more diversity? Um, in the work that you all do, do it's with various industries, but um, what are some, and Sarah, I know you talked a little bit about the recommendations that were from the report that you had worked on, but maybe if I could turn it to um, Abby first, just uh, as far as, you know, ar around the, the your peers and the communities that you are in talking about some of these issues, what are, do you think are some effective strategies for making the, the narrative shifts and maybe in just the, the conversations you have with your peers, but also in your work at CSS? Yeah, that's great. Uh, I think a lot of it, as uh, Sarai was saying earlier, is talk about it. Uh, having conversations is a huge positive step forward. So if you see that this uh, movie isn't diverse, tell all your friends, uh, tweet about it or something. I don't really know how social media works. Um, but yeah, opening those conversations and moving through having the positive discussions, I think is a great step forward. And also being open in your personal life to these tough conversations. Uh, being as uh, someone who falls sure. outside of the gender binary, uh, having conversations with my friends about like, what does that mean to you? Uh, just general confusion uh, has been really, really helpful and very kind. And especially when those around me are willing to be like, oh, whoa, I'm learning more about how people can be through this conversation. That's a absolutely beautiful thing. Uh, also, 
watch what content creators you consume from. Uh, if someone out there is like, oh, this guy is a little questionable, maybe look into why this guy's a little questionable. Uh, try not to fall victim to mob mentality. If everyone's hating on this one person, be like, okay, let's do a little bit of critical outside thinking here. Is this perhaps sexist? Is this perhaps homophobic for some reason? Or is there a good point? Maybe I shouldn't be supporting that. Uh, I think a lot of small, not small, everything's big, uh, but a lot of these specific issues can be solved with a bit of uh, critical media literacy. Be careful of the content you consume and how you talk about it. Thanks, Abby. Yeah, and if Fernando and Soraya have any closing recommendations or action items, then feel free to jump in. Go ahead, Fernando. You know, the, the way just before this meeting, I was, we worked with the UN Women and the Stereotype Alliance, and we were preparing some framework on how communicators and creatives can judge the work they do and even inform more than just the work they do before doing. We, we are doing a, a tool that's called the Free Piece, Frame, Free Piece Framework that is looking from presence, perspective, and personalities of the communication that you you put out there so the way we are acting is through through that education and, and discussion because it's uh, when you start seeing what you haven't seen you cannot know what you don't know so people was uh, unaware of it and when we call out the some of the um, unconscious biases and say look we never ask these questions when we do communication uh, when we see at the crowds that do the communication, not only what you show, is I think something with the collective learning, and it's, it enter more in a in a in a virtual cycle. So what we can do is also be open about our own unconscious uh, bias, uh, listen to to that, and try to engage on our work, whatever we do, with dif from different angles, thinking what we can do better. We, we, we have this free piece for communication, but in, in certain areas that you do, and it's not just only in the output, but how you engage with, with the people who you hire, uh, where you work from and so on. Thanks, Fernando. Um, as if Sarai, if you don't have any other closing thoughts, I'll hand it over to Jose to wrap us up. Great, thanks. Thank you, Caroline, for that. And thank you again, Abby, Soraya, and Fernando for having been a part of this conversation. I'm incredibly happy that I've been able to talk to all of you to get to know Soraya and Abby, who I didn't know before. It's, I think that going back to that idea of the backlash that is happening to the laws that are being passed, to the general sense of fear and, and how bleak the world seems to be at times, it is really great to get to meet people that are there and that are fighting the good fight and they're at, at, are part of that thing that I, I, I like to see as a resistance in terms of how we, how, how we phase and tackle each day on the work that we're doing. It is really great to see the work that the Norman Lear Center is doing, that the Center for Scholars and Storytellers is doing, to see that someone in the industry that sometimes we can be very critical of those industries <laughs> in terms of the media and advertising, but to see that the, the industry itself is trying to change from inside the matrix is quite powerful, refreshing, and reassuring as well. I was saying before that represent can be it can mean different things, can be an image that's sensing for something, can mean reintroducing meaning. And that idea of re signifying reality has a lot of power. It has had a lot of what we see matters, what we don't see matters as well. And a more diverse representation in the media and a more diverse representation in online in the online gaming and the digital space means a more diverse representation, a more diverse society as well. It opens the doors for us to accept diversity, for us to be able to enjoy the diversity. I think that we live in a world that is governed sometimes by people that learn to see the world in black and white because of their TV content, but also for that idea of reinforced binaries all the time. And we are starting to see how a generation that learned to see the world in color is able to affect that and is able to move us. And I just want to open the door for further dialogue. This GBI webinar series is something that is going to continue. And I think that there is a lot of value in us sitting down 
answering questions, talking about what we're doing and bringing, I think, hope to others that there is something that is being done, but also opening the doors for everyone that has been attending this event so that they know that they can reach out to us and that they can in get involved and join the conversation. Thank you, Caroline, as well, for making this possible. Thank you, Meili Granados, who has been <laughs> helping us with the interpretation at this space. And thank you, Hannah Shoset from our comms team at Equimundo, who is always the tech wizard behind these spaces. Um, um, I hope to I get to see you and talk to you soon. Bye, thank you.